Hello again, it's uh, Paul Beckwith, and uh, this is Sally. Sally's a little bit distracted, but uh, she's been very happy to help me out with these videos with a little bit of coercion from treats, etc. Shackleton's nowhere to be seen, and I tried to get Mop, but he's even more elusive than, than uh, Shackleton. So I'm going to continue uh, discussing the uh, latest uh, science on blocking and how we expect blocking to change um, as climate change, as rapid climate change proceeds. So although there's no hard and fast uh, definition and agreement by meteorologists on blocking, there's these five main configurations going from the simplest ridge with two troughs and symmetry. The uh, temperature is the color. So these are colder areas connected to the Arctic. These are warmer areas here. Um, when the troughs deepen and the ridge goes further up, you can get these closed uh, contours. And, uh, you know, this is the type of block called the omega block. Then if there's rotation of this whole thing so that you lose symmetry, extending the depth and size of this ridge at the expense of this one, then this whole thing tilts off to the side, okay, in an anti-cyclonic wave-breaking fashion. If you get a cyclonic wave-breaking, then this ridge deepens and gets tilted. This, this trough, rather, deepens and gets tilted, and this trough diminishes, and you get the ridge up here. So this is cyclonic wave-breaking uh, locking situation. And then if you get this configuration, but you get the development of a low pressure area down here, you have the so-called Rex or dipole block. Dipole being a high pressure area here and a low pressure area uh, just uh, south of it in the Rex dipole block. Now the dynamics of blocking. Okay, there's a major weakness in dynamical meteorology. There's no comprehensive theory that captures the different processes that act at all stages of the blocking life cycle. The onset of the blocking, the maintenance of it, what keeps it stable, and the decay of it. A key characteristic of the onset of the block is a rapid poleward displacement of subtropical air. So you get a large scale extended ridge within a Rosby wave pattern on the mid latitude jet stream. Both the potential temperature theta and the potential vorticity are approximately conserved following air parcels. So we can get, if the potential vorticity increases in one region, it has to decrease in an adjacent region. Same with the temperature. Development of the ridge extension occurs rapidly, typically on the time scale of one to three days. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, you can have an interaction of the Rosby waves of different wavelengths, uh, and you can get different types of configurations, as I showed you up here, the five different types of configurations. Um, often a rapid cyclogenesis is required for the establishment of the block. So that would be, uh, you know, uh, cyclogenesis, um, you know, cyclone forming, and that would be on the wings. So they could be forming first and then, and then the ridge develops as a result. The cyclone moves slowly, so the air mass on the ridge moves, uh, can, can move quite far north and maintain its characteristics. But it's difficult to establish cause and effect since the large scale steering flow of winds approaching the block region before the onset of the block is often weak. And then it can increase. Now you can have these synoptic or weather map scale eddies and uh, the planetary scale background flow. They're tightly coupled at the onset of the blocking. Um, now, an essential aspect of a block is that the dynamics are able to maintain it in the same position relative to an observer on the ground for long periods of time. I mean, these things can form and then last several weeks. Okay. Um, there's a balance between the advection by the background zonal flow, so the air coming in, going up the ridge, coming out, and the Rosby wave pattern. Um, how do we maintain the block? There's something called the, the modon, and this isn't a typo, it's not supposed to be modern. The modon theory, it, it has to do with the advection and how a coherent vortex dipole, so 
high and low pressure, it can propagate against a uniform flow. So you have generally flow from west to east, and you can have these structures uh, being somewhat stationary within the flow patterns. You can see this from fluid mechanics, and this could be a situation that's happening here. We just don't know. Um, the block longevity can be positive feedback of these synoptic weather map scale eddies on the blocking structure. Um, you, you get wave breaking in some cases, um, different vorticity anomalies in the block. Um, you know, the upper level flow is highly dynamic. So it doesn't, although the whole, the whole system is somewhat stationary, you get stationary planetary Rosby waves, there's a lot of dynamics within the actual um, blocking. There's also diabatic effects that are thought to be involved in the dynamics for the onset of the blocking and the maintenance. So what diabatic is, energy is added to the system. So you can have poleward moving air within the warm sector underneath the ridge of an intensifying cyclone. You get strong dynamical forcing. This stuff is rising through the atmosphere into the ridge and it's called the warm conveyor belt, okay? Um, the warm conveyor belt. Okay, so what happens is this warm air from further south that is humid goes into the ridge. And as the air rises, heat is released because you get condensation. The water vapor condenses out into droplets and it releases heat. And that heat keeps the thing uh, ascending, going higher and higher, and it amplifies the the uh, cyclone growth rate. This heating enables the WCB, the warm conveyor belt air, to cross temperature surfaces and outflow at a higher level. So basically it brings energy from the boundary layer to the tropopause level of the jet streams in these ridges. And the temperature can rise typically um, 20 to 25 degrees uh, Kelvin or 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. So this adds energy, it can help maintain the, the, the block. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the work on blocks has, talk, has, has been for dry air, but there's also uh, a lot of the, the uh, warm conveyor belt air um, is, uh, it contains a lot of moisture. So you can't consider just the dry situation. The moisture can, is, can, is, is thought to have a large effect in the blocks in the development of the blocks, the maintenance of the blocks, and also the, uh, the why they dissipate. Um, okay, so um, so there's these there's both adiabatic where no energy is basically lost or gained. There's and and there's diabatic transport pathways. So two different processes are working, um, and uh, so about thirty to forty five percent of the air parcels in the low potential vorticity anomaly of blocks experience heating of a greater of above two degrees Kelvin over the last three days, implying that latent heat releases of high importance for ridge building and block maintenance. And then when you don't have that latent heat release anymore, that moisture, then the block can fail. So we're, we need to learn more and more about the dynamics. And the slow decay of blocks is linked to the radiative decay of the anomalies. Um, but it's also associated, it's more likely associated with a breakdown of the maintenance process or disruption through advection by other systems, such that it's sort of just broken, broken out. Now, there's also connections to the stratosphere. There's lead lag connections between winter blocking and polar stratospheric variability. Um, and this affects the polar vortex strength. And then the effect change of the polar vortex in the stratosphere can then feed back and affect the the block. So, you know, there is likely a relationship of high latitude blocking frequency and or duration to stratospheric sudden warming events, which I've talked about in some pr previous videos. Um, and also, you know, where blocking occurs, the oceanic westerly flow and the associated winds provide warmth in the winter and chill in the summer. Because these winds are obstructed during blocking, we get a seasonal extreme. So we can be very cold in the winter from a block, very hot in the summer, reduced cloud cover in the anticyclonic or high pressure region, 
um, causes net warming in summer, cooling in winter. Um, and but so that it makes the radiative effects much more important in summer. So more light can reach in, in under the high pressure region because there's no clouds. And in the winter, um, it can be much, much colder also. So there's a lot of blocking events in the spring and autumn, but they don't lead to the warmest and coldest days annually. So we don't tend to think of them, but they do affect the agricultural sector, for example, and the growing season. So if there's multiple blocks over agricultural growing regions, then we can experience global food shortages. Um, so these blocks over your, the Euro-Atlantic blocks, they enhance the likelihood of heat waves beneath the anticyclonic region and cold spells equatorward and downstream of the blocking high. Blocking also has strong hydrological impacts because although, you know, under the, air, under the ridge, you don't get the, um, uh, under the ridge, you don't get the, um, well, it's very, very hot and warm, but regions adjacent to the block can have extreme rainfall due to the persistent deflection of the synoptic storms along the same path. So the block deflects the weather away, either northward or southward of the blocked region. And you, if you get persistent deflection of these storms, then they can, there can be excess precipitation and floods in those regions. Uh, you know, blocks can steer hurricanes. So Hurricane Sandy was steered westwards and went across the coast into New York City um, because of a blocking high over Greenland. And you can also get particulate matter building up in the winter in these blocked regions or surface ozone in the spring or and summer. The strongest impacts of blocking are due to its persistence, which can allow temperature and moisture anomalies to build up over one or more weeks. So we can look at the Russian heat wave of 2010, the, the flooding in Pakistan um, connected with the trough of the same uh, uh, block, um, omega block. Um, and uh, there's also, but so, you know, what's it, we know that's affected by the Arctic, but there's also a lot of interaction from the tropics. Um, once you get blocking occurring and drying, the soil anomalies can amplify the surface heat during the summer blocks. Um, okay, so the land atmosphere interactions are very important in association with the blocks. Now, how do we measure the blocks? There's something called the blocking index. And there's a lot of, there, because there's all these different types of blocks, there's many different types of blocking indexes. Okay, so uh, there's three different types of indexes. One is considered the, uh, the, 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 one is based on anomalies. There's uh, absolute field reversal is a second one. And there's a combination of the two. That's the cat, by the way, just destroying stuff. Okay, so this is blocking climatology. Uh, this is the blocking frequency. Okay, is the color scale. Uh, so 2% would be 2% of the days of the season would be blocked. So December, January, February, um, these, this is the scale. The red area here would be about 18 to 20% of the days in this time frame, December, January, February, are high blocking down in this region. So the redder the area, the more the higher the frequency of blocking. And these are the three different models. Um, and this is for the summer, June, July, August. So blocking here, you know, the, the models show, show different things, the different indices of the models. Um, but there's also lots of other effects like, um, you know, but we need to get better horizontal resolution in the models, vertical resolution, info on sea surface temperature, improved orography. These are mountains or, you know, flat areas, the terrain. Um, and, look, and understand things like convection and drag better to, to, in order to see how the blocking um, proceeds. Now, blocking has always been a challenge for numerical weather models and climate models. They underestimate both the occurrence and persistence of events. So, you know, for example, the CMIP-5 uh, climate models, they underestimate the blocking in the Atlantic European regions by about 30 to 50% of the observed frequency in winter and about 10 to 30% in the summer. So they're not very accurate in terms of getting the frequency of blocking um, 
and they need to be improved significantly. Well, thank you for listening. Bye for now.